You may have heard of the Capacitor Plague, which resulted in an unusually high number of casualties, particularly among motherboards. Between the years 1999 and 2007, many faulty aluminum electrolytic capacitors were produced, mainly from Taiwanese manufacturers and used in computer hardware. Industrial espionage was suspected to be at the heart of the capacitor crisis, involving the theft of an electrolyte formula. A scientist employed by Rubicon in Japan departed the company, taking the secret water-based electrolyte formula used in Rubicon capacitors and began working for a Chinese company. The scientists then developed a copy of this electrolyte. Later, a group of employees who defected from the Chinese company copied an incomplete version of the formula and began marketing it to numerous aluminum electrolytic manufacturers in Taiwan, undercutting the prices set by the Japanese manufacturers. Unfortunately, this incomplete electrolyte lacked essential proprietary ingredients necessary for the long-term stability of the capacitors. Most capacitors filled with the incorrectly formulated electrolyte failed within two years. The ASUS P4B motherboard, designed for Intel Pentium 4 CPUs, is testimony of the era when the capacitor plague was rampant. This board has 7 damaged capacitors near the CPU socket and they are probably part of the power delivery for the CPU. They are all Nichicon 3300 microfarad capacitors rated for 6.3 volts. In today's video, I will remove the faulty capacitors and see what measurements I can get from them. Maybe we will discover some interesting information and could conclude if the board would have powered on in this state. I did not dare to connect this board to a power supply with those capacitors still part of the circuitry out of fear they may explode, short circuit or cause any other unexpected situation. What I do dare is to tell you about today's video sponsor. PCBWay offers a wide variety of services including PCB manufacturing, 3D printing and CNC machining. All PCBs I have ordered from PCBWay were absolutely flawless and make me smile every time one of my projects come to life. PCBWay is also in the process to organize their 6th project design contest where electronic and mechanical designs are welcomed this year. If you have the skills, it is well worth participating with amazing prizes to be won. You still have time to submit your project until mid of January 2024. Good luck with your submission and have a look at PCBWay.com to turn your projects into reality. I do not know if this motherboard works, but we will find out in a future video once I repaired the flaws I could find. You have already seen the damaged capacitors in the previous clips. Unfortunately, I have yet to receive the replacements. There is also this scratch on the back of the board across some traces. Luckily, it looks like the copper is not broken and I just need to reapply some fresh solder mask. The new solder mask will protect the copper from oxidizing, but also from any further potential scratches which could cut the exposed traces. I'm using solder masks from the brand Mechanic, which works really well for my DIY projects. It also came with a UV lamp. After a few minutes under the UV light, the solder mask has hardened. Here is the ASUS P4B motherboard with the capacitors marked that need to be replaced. In past videos, I have noticed that the ring light of my microscope causes strong reflections, which degrades the video quality. So I got some extra lights that hopefully will improve the video clips I take with the microscope. Let's try the new lights and see if they make a difference. Oh wow, this does make a big difference. I guess you will see future videos with this light instead of the ring light. But let's continue now to remove the capacitors. Fresh solder and a bit of flux help to melt the 20 year old solder around the capacitor legs. Unfortunately, the solder wick was not effective because of the big copper plane you can see here. It absorbs most of the heat delivered by the soldering iron. So I set my soldering iron to 380 degrees celsius, heated up one of the soldering joints and wiggled the capacitor slowly out of their position, alternating between the two solder joints. It may have been better to use a hot air station to heat up the board, but my wiggle method worked really well too. All 7 capacitors are now removed from the board and they are in really bad condition. What I want to do now is to find out what readings we can get from those capacitors. And here are two good capacitors with the same capacitance for comparison. Unfortunately, they do not have the correct size to fit on the board. While we are waiting for the replacements to arrive, let's do some measurements and maybe learn a bit more about capacitors. I have a component tester here, a very cheap device that can tell you some details about the component you are testing. I will test each capacitor we took off the motherboard, but first, let's see how a good capacitor behaves.
The two new capacitors have the same capacitance of the ones we took off the motherboard. 3300 microfarad. The component tester gives us three values. ESR, or equivalent series resistance, is the internal resistance of the capacitor. The blue capacitor has an ESR value of 0.36 ohms. We also see a VLOS value. From what I've read is that this value is questionable, but it may give us some more information about a capacitor's health. As far as I understood, this value shows the self-discharge or voltage drop over time. Maybe we will understand it better when measuring the damaged capacitors. But for now, the good capacitors show a value of 2.8%. And the final value is the capacitance. This capacitor is rated at 3300 microfarad, but the tester shows a bit less of 3138 microfarad. For reference, let's test the green capacitor as well. Here, the ESR is 0.29 ohms. VLOS is also less at only 1.6%, and the capacitance is very close to the rated 3300 microfarad. Okay then, let's have a look at the capacitors we have taken off the motherboard. I numbered the capacitors from 1 to 7. I will measure each capacitor 3 times with a component tester and take the average for a graph later on. The first capacitor shows an ESR of 1.6 ohms. But the VLOS is at 22%. That is significantly higher than the values we obtained from the new capacitors. Surprisingly, the capacitance seems to be a lot higher at over 3700 microfarad. That's interesting. Let's move on with the other capacitors. I do not want to bore you with the remaining 6 capacitors which show almost identical numbers. The maximum ESR I could measure was around 2 ohms. VLOS for almost all capacitors was between 20 and 30%, except for capacitor number 6, which had a VLOS of only 11%. And the capacitance of all capacitors was a lot higher than it should have been. One even got up to almost 6000 microfarad. Of course, these values may not be very accurate. However, I could see a trend here. The capacitors from the motherboard had a high VLOS value, and at the same time, a very high capacitance. Could there be a connection? Let's do a sanity check and test the capacitors using a multimeter. The blue capacitor checks out at about 3200 microfarad. The component tester reported a value of 3138. Close enough. The green capacitor does hit its rated capacitance of 3300 microfarad. So, what about the capacitors from the motherboard? And the first capacitor reports 6000 microfarad, and then 5500 during the second test. Capacitor 2 also reports over 5000 microfarad. And so do the remaining 5 capacitors, some of them even a lot higher at 7000 microfarad. Clearly, the capacitance test is not really helpful, at least not with the equipment I have. However, I think VLOS may be an indicator for what is happening here. Capacitors with high VLOS seem to leak their charge way above average. While the test takes place, those capacitors leak their charge, like a plastic cup with holes in the bottom you try to fill with water. <laughs> There's no reserve! The testing equipment may not anticipate the high loss in charge during the test, and therefore believe it to be a capacitor with a much higher capacitance. All while most of the charge has already disappeared. That is a bit disappointing, because there is no clear way to identify a problem with those capacitors. The VLOS value may be a good indicator, but apparently it is a made up value. So I decided to wire up a simple circuit to test the capacitors using a blue light emitting diode. There are a few resistors in series which add up to 125 ohms. The blue LED requires a voltage of 2.5 volts. There are also a push button and an IC socket which I will use to connect the capacitors to the circuit. The circuit is powered by 5 volts which is below the rated voltage of 6.3 volts of the capacitors from the motherboard. I also hooked up a multimeter that measures the current flowing through the circuit. Without any capacitor in the circuit, the LED powers on when I press the push button and immediately switches off when I release it. Let's see how the circuit behaves with one of the good capacitors connected to the socket. With a green capacitor in place, you may notice that there is a very short delay before the LED fades quickly into full brightness. When I release the button, the LED fades out slowly. It takes several seconds before the LED is completely dark. So let's start how the capacitors from the motherboard behave. We start with a capacitor having the number 1 written to it, 
And look at that, the LED fades in a lot slower compared to the good capacitor. It also looks like the LED does not shine as bright as before. When I release the push button, the LED immediately goes dark. There is no fade out. You can also see that the multimeter reports over 19 milliamps. Maybe now we can understand the VLOS value a bit better. A good capacitor had a value of around 2% or less. This capacitor has over 20% VLOS. It looks like it is leaking a lot of current. When I disconnect the capacitor from the circuit while the LED is on, you see how the LED suddenly spikes in brightness. It seems that the capacitor opens a gate to ground where some of the current disappears. Capacitor 2 and 3 behave very similarly. Capacitor 4 however prevents the LED from turning on. The current is over 22 milliamps. It looks like there is too much current leaking and not enough left for the LED to turn on. Capacitor 5 and 6 behave similar to the first three capacitors. The LED slowly fades in and immediately turns off when the push button is released. And capacitor 7 behaves like capacitor 4. The LED does not turn on. The capacitor causes the circuit to consume 24 milliamps. The good capacitors do not interfere with the circuit when removed or reconnected while the LED is on. The capacitors from the motherboard however seem to not hold any charge. The moment they are disconnected from the circuit, the LED increases its brightness. Once they are reconnected, the LED turns off and slowly fades into medium brightness for 5 of the capacitors. Capacitor 4 and 7 cause the LED to remain off. Here you can see that when the good capacitors are charged and reconnected to the circuit, the LED is switching on. The LED then fades out as we have seen before when I release the push button. The capacitors from the motherboard do not hold any charge. Instead they open the floodgates to ground and let a portion of the current disappear. So, what do you think? What would have happened if I switched on the board with those capacitors still in place? Here are my thoughts. If the LED would be an indicator, I could imagine that there would just not be enough current and voltage for the CPU to turn on. It could also be that the power stages on the board will be overwhelmed by the increased power draw, since the capacitors leak current to ground. In the worst case, this could potentially damage the power regulators on the motherboard. I don't think this board would have worked with those capacitors still in place. Now we just have to wait for the replacements, and then we can get into the Pentium 4 era and an AGP 4X slot. And with this we have reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed today's excursion into the behavior of damaged capacitors. If you did, please consider giving this video a like and subscribe to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon, where you will get early access to my videos and behind the scenes information. And finally a big thanks to the people already supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.